I want a little bit of audience participation at the beginning. It's the only bit I want from you. Is there anyone here? No, we'll do it this way. Put your hands up if you have seen a previous TED Talk, either live or on a screen. Everyone. You will know that what tends to happen is someone comes out, they stand in um, a red circle, they're not really encouraged to move very much from the circle, but I thought, we've seen a lot of these things now, going to buck the trend a little bit. Um, so I thought I'd bring along a chair, um, but this size. Um, this is a beautiful thing. This is exactly 100 years old. It is called, helpfully, uh, a red and blue chair. It's made by a Dutch designer called Gerrit Rietveld. It's, the real thing is 88 centimetres uh, high, which is about here or so. And you can see it's got an angled back and an angled front. It's actually very comfortable if you're a mouse. But um, I thought it's getting lonely there, so I thought I would bring myself here as well. Um, looking slightly smarter with a jacket than I am um, to, uh, today, and unfortunately, it doesn't bend because uh, it's made out of sandstone. So I'll probably go there. Once I've been there for a while, it's probably a little bit dull, certainly at that angle. So um, I feel like a magician here. There's going to be a ra uh, definitely going to be a rabbit at the end of this. TV. Um, so we're going to put this here and move myself back so I can... See it. And when you've watched the latest Netflix series and you're getting bored with that and you're lucky enough, maybe, to live in Paris, you can look out the window and see this. Um, the Eiffel Tower. Now, when this was made and when it opened in uh, 1889, it was the tallest structure, the tallest man-made, person-made structure in the world. Um, and if you were brave enough, uh, and this took some bra bravery, to go to the first platform there, you could see something extraordinary. If you were even braver and you went up, there was an elevator after a while, but the initial visitors had to walk up and you ended up here. You could see something that, unless you were fortunate enough to... Um, go up in a hot air balloon or maybe a very early aeroplane that you'd never seen before. And this was the city of Paris laid out essentially in miniature. No one had seen this before. You had no possibility. Notre Dame Cathedral was essentially the tallest you could get before this. Um, and uh, you could see the uh, beautiful Haussmann boulevards. You could see maybe where you lived. You could see the church maybe in relation to a school or shop. And maybe you got thinking two things. One, how insignificant we are. We thought we sort of can patrol, we can man manoeuvre, we can flaneur wherever we want in Paris. But actually, looking down, it sounds like a terrible cliché now. You look down from that height and you see people as ants and you see ourselves as very insignificant. And this was just in Paris, one city in a huge world. Um, and you think, OK, well, that's interesting. Uh, and we've made ourselves miniature, but we're also taller. So we have a sense of control. And that's really what I like to talk about today, which is our sense of scale and how it affects the way we think about our lives and the way we think about um, the world. Um, so I'm, um, I think, um, I'm going to take myself off here because I'm getting a little bit um, bored um, on there. I want to um, see whether this reminds you of anything. Um, it reminded me um, of this, which is um, Pierre Mondrian from the 1920s. This was actually painted after this chair was made. So who knows whether or not it was actually um, an influence. And it also reminded me a little bit of uh, this. 
um, which, and it's tea time now, of course, so that looks even more um, tempting. And I kind of thought, OK, so where did this fascination with miniature things um, begin uh, for, for me? Um, sort of began there. That's me preparing my TED talk. Um, <laughs> and um, this is me here on the mantelpiece, the figure you've just seen. You can see it even more clearly now with another miniature house. Now, I was a bit interested in, Le in the Lego, a bit interested in, I don't know, you know, action men and toy dolls and toy soldiers. What I really liked to do was play Sabutio, which is, I don't know whether that's still... Uh, is part of your um, kind of childhood uh, world. But it's uh, basically a football game. But what I really like to, to do um, was go here. Now, this is um, Beckenscott Model Village in Beaconsfield. It's an extraordinary place. It's been going for 89 years. It measures the size of a football field. Has anyone been there? OK, the older generation has been in there, I can see. And it's um, wonderful for all sorts of reasons. It's wonderful because you walk around, as a kid or an adult, thinking, um, I'm seeing things that I've never really noticed uh, before. Uh, and these could be things like, you see here, just above here, there's a bit of smoke. And that turns out to be this, which is a, a thatched cottage on fire. And um, the good news is that the fire people are here. They're only about one inch tall, but they're dealing with, 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 with it. And this happens on a regular basis at Beck and Scott. So it's a wonderful thing because you get a sense of the world. You also get a sense of, well, in miniature, what are, the, what are we as people, as builders of models, considered to be important things? You know, why is this building? The Colosseum we can understand because it's ancient and it's, you know, it survives up to a point and we all know its history. Uh, other buildings, significant as well. So obviously Big Ben is going to feature in the UK. Eiffel Tower. Every, I think it's fair to say that every single model village in the world has an Eiffel Tower in it, including the new one that opened just um, a year ago, I think, in um, New York called Gulliver's Gate, which, again, super high-tech model village, huge hit in Times Square, inevitably what people really like to see, even though they've paid their admission in Times Square, is a model of Times Square. We are just fascinated by seeing things made small. We have a sense of control. Um, I have a friend who thinks that the real reason we like building things in miniature is out of frustration. That we are basically, we basically feel that the world is a gloomy and confusing place, but if we can control something, we can go into a shed and build it, or just a room where we set aside, or we get together with friends, then we can control something. And we have power that we only really had as kids playing with toys, moving Lego bricks around, and we can have that back again. The ultimate more, the ultimate sort of model, of course, is this place, uh, Las Vegas, uh, where there are a huge amount of hotels which are built. This is a half-size uh, Eiffel Tower. Um, and you can see the hotel behind, and this is Paris, Las Vegas, as the Venetian Las Vegas for the, you know, if, you're, if you want to go, if you're slightly romantically obtuse and you want to take a gondola ride, you can do that in Las Vegas, around the hotel, or inside the hotel. And it's an extraordinary place. But again, it speaks to our desire to sort of shrink the world to comprehensible uh, proportions. I love this quote. This is from Alberto Giacometti, the sculptor. He says, by doing something a half centimeter high, you are more likely to get a sense of the universe than if you try to do the whole sky. What does that mean? It means that we can't change the world dramatically, but we can do it incrementally, and we can do it more accurately if we concentrate on a very small um, thing. 
Um, what does uh, the designer Dieter Ram say? He says, good design is as little design as possible. Um, I love this. This is um, George Lois, uh, an art director on Esquire, um, who um, is a wonderful designer because he manages to encapsulate things in a, in a very, very uh, sort of direct and, 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 and poignant way. This is obviously Andy Warhol in soup cans. But is that a big Andy, uh, a life-size Andy, an enormous soup can? Or is it a regular soup can and a tiny Andy? Um, who knows? George Lois, incidentally, also came up with a fantastic quote in relation to miniature, which is, the only thing that gets better when it gets bigger is a penis. Um, so if you take nothing else from this afternoon, um, this is um, where it all began for us in miniature. These are the first fi figurines that we have in museums uh, that represent something um, of the human form uh, that we want to take in, in this case, into the afterworld. These are Egyptian shabtis, uh, or u shabtis, also known as. Um, and this, these ones are from 1225 um, BCE. And um, it's a little bit hard to tell, but if you zoom in here, you can see that they've got things that they've crossed uh, against their chest. Now, the idea of these is that, and if you were wealthy, you had a lot of these in your coffin when you were buried in a tomb in Egypt, um, you would have something across your chest that relieved you of a task in the afterlife. Now, these look like A's, but the people here didn't want to be relieved of calligraphy or font design. What they wanted to be relieved of is hoeing, and these are hoes, and the idea was that you had one for everything that you didn't want to do in the afterlife, whatever that was. And the wealthier you were, the more of these that you had in your coffin, and some people had hundreds, uh, sort of packed all around them, um, and this would then guarantee you uh, a nice life. Um, so, the miniature makes us look closer and understand more, and we bring things down to size to find out what's really going on. Now, what's really going on here? Uh, this is um, a sad tale. This is a slave ship. Looks beautiful. Actually, what's going on underneath is this. You can't see it that well from this picture, but you can from here. These are slaves. Um, these are slaves packed into this ship. Um, you can see them around the corner here, uh, you know, going, going everywhere. This is a horrendous picture. This was basically the end of the 18th century. The slave trade was huge uh, all over. We, uh, in this country, as guilty as anyone, um, and slaves would come in from Africa, come to the port of Liverpool, be shipped out to Jamaican sugar plantations, and make a lot of people very wealthy on the back of um, terrible, inhumane uh, treatment of um, our fellow beings. Now, if you were a humane person, you wanted to put an end to this. So people like William Wilberforce, who was an MP, a campaigner called Thomas Clarkson, and William Elford, who was a banker and also a painter, said, how do we do this? They campaigned in America um, and in France and in England, in Parliament, to try and rid the world of the slave trade. And they tried for years, and they made amazing speeches. But the only thing that actually hastened the end of the slave trade was when Wilberforce got up in Parliament and produced essentially this in model form, in a wooden model, and said, this is what it's like. And only then could fellow MPs really understand what was going on. So again, Big slave ship doesn't work. People don't go, but it didn't go to see it, and they couldn't comprehend the scale of it. But the scale, brought down to size, made perfect sense in a model where you see these tiny characters uh, packed in. Um, I thought I'd end by uh, talking uh, about something a little bit more fun, the flea circus. Now, this is an entertainment that is no longer uh, with us. But what a wonderful thing. Victorian times, you can see here fleas doing, well, what aren't they doing? I'll tell you what they're, they're, they're doing. They're doing 
They're drawing carriages, juggling a ball, operating a merry-go-round, presenting large pantomime ballet in ladies' costume. How do they do this? They were in horrible, horrible conditions, these poor fleas. They were finally let out. They were tethered, and it looked like they were doing anything. So if you put something on the end of a flea's um, proboscis or uh, on a foot, it looked like they were fighting a duel. How cruel is that? Why did it die out? It died out pretty much because of these and technology and other forms of much, much earlier entertainment. This is the ultimate miniature thing. Um, so I'm going to leave you with this. This is a question. Uh, is this um, a uh, real-size uh, Eiffel Tower and a funny uh, trick with photography? Or is this a very, very large hand? Or is this a model? Who knows? I can't say. So I'm going to sit here now, um, and I'm going to read a book. And I'm going to read a book about miniature things, which is here, which is a very lovely thing. And I'm going to do that. But if that's too big, I'm going to use this, which is an even smaller version of that book. So small, I have to keep it in a plastic bag. It's a real thing. It's a real cover. I don't know whether you can see this, but it's a real thing. Here, I've actually got that back to front. There we are. So that's that. So um, I have a final item which I'd like to uh, bring out. And we're going to put these away now. And it's this. This is the ultimate symbol of a miniature thing. This is us. This is what we know as, you know, we're the, we, we are, the, we are the, the blue dot here. Um, and... Thinking about all these things, I'll leave you with a, a, a last quote, that you, we are pondering the big things in life in a small way. And I like to think that by so doing, uh, we might have a tiny impact on the way we live and by extension make a small contribution to the way of the world. Thank you very much.